We now turn to uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and his Existentialism in Human Emotions, um, uh, which is a book designed to address several fairly simple criticisms of the existentialist position. Um, just a few words about Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, he was born in 1905 and died in 1980, so he is, bar none, the most contemporary theorist uh, that, that, that we're going to study in this course. And um, uh, he was also, uh, just judging by his age and the fact that he's French, um, he was, he was actually present and lived in France during the Nazi occupation. Um, it, during that time, he was an active member of the resistance, uh, had sort of a torrid love affair uh, with a lady by the name of Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, his books I do not have here with me today, but nonetheless, um, she is a very, very important existentialist and uh, feminist theorist as well. Um, the ethics of ambiguity, the second sex, that sort of thing sort of frames modern feminism um, in a really, really intelligent way. Uh, Jean Balsart uh, was a very prolific writer um, in, in both literary field and uh, philosophically. Uh, his magnum opus, uh, being a nothingness, is it, it's 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 a huge tome and actually quite interesting um, when it comes to explaining what existential phenomenology is. But um, I guess enough about the biography. Um, Jean Paul Sartre, uh, well, like I say, is an existentialist, um, which is sort of a postmodern theory that develops out of what we've seen in Nietzsche. Um, essentially what, what Jean-Paul Sartre does is reads between the lines in Nietzsche and other theorists to articulate a position that can be um, slogan uh, in terms of a slogan summed up uh, in terms of uh, what you find on page 13, uh, existence precedes essence. It's important to get an idea of what he means by existence preceding essence, and uh, we've seen a few theorists, um, it, you, mostly Immanuel Kant, John Stuart Mill, and um, Aristotle, who start with a description of the essence of human beings. Right? A human being is an essence or a definition, right? And particular human beings are just in, in particular examples of that definition. Existentialism, on the other hand, um, holds that existence precedes essence, or first we exist, and then through our choices, uh, through our actions, and through the exercise of our freedom, then we define ourselves. This is different. This is very different than um, what you get from a mouse, or a book, or a table, or a chair, right? Where uh, we, from the blueprint or design or definition of the thing, then make particular ones, right? Human beings, uh, assert, asserts, are different. Um, he uses the example of uh, a paper cutter um, to describe uh, this. Where is it? If, on the other hand, page 17, existence precedes essence, we grant that we exist, uh, exist and fashion our image at one and the same time, the image is valid for everybody and uh, for your whole age. Thus, we t uh, thus our responsibility is much greater than we might have supposed because uh, it in involves all of mankind. Right? Um, do, 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 uh, actually, let's go back to. Um, uh, page 15, where he's describing at the bottom of the page, man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. Such is the first principle of existentialism. It's also what, what <clears throat> it, it is also what is called subjectivity, the name we are labeled with when charges are brought against us. But what do we mean by this if not that man has a greater dig uh, dignity than a stone or a table? For we mean that man first exists, that is, that man first of all is the being who hurls himself toward a future and who is conscious of 
uh, imagining himself as being in the future. Man is, uh, at the start, a plan which is aware of itself rather than a patch of moss or a piece of garbage or cauliflower. Nothing exists prior to this plan. There is nothing in heaven. Man will be what he uh, will have planned to be, um, not what he will want to be, because uh, by the word will, we generally mean a conscious decision, which is subsequent to um, uh, what we have already made uh, of ourselves. I may want to belong to a political party, to write a book, to get married, but all uh, that uh, is um, uh, all that is only a manifestation of an earlier, more spontaneous choice that is called the will. But if existence really does precede essence, man is responsible for what it is. Thus, existentialism's first move is to make every man aware of what he is and to uh, make the full responsibility for existence, his existence rest on him. You see, what Jean Paul Sartre is doing um, is avoiding a pitfall. Uh, to a certain extent, um, what we tend to do, ethically speaking, when we start with essence and work from there, is um, basically establish that essence as a scapegoat, right, in order to dodge responsibility. We saw some of this in terms of Nietzsche. If we are determined by an essence, which is one of the moves that, that, that Nietzsche points out that we are prone to, 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 to actually make, right? then whatever we are, whatever we will become, whatever we do, uh, to a certain extent, is uh, the result of something that's not our choosing. Right? Think about it in colloquial terms, right? Whenever we see a riot or war or uh, generally man's inhumanity to man, uh, we might call it. We, we just, uh, you know, in German, uh, it, it's ach du lieber, or uh, basically oh, oh humanity, right? We, we blame some sort of inherent cruelty or inherent limitations on our essence. Uh, this is a way of deflecting responsibility away from ourselves. Effectively, what the existentialists have done, and I, I think, and we'll see some, some arguments for this, is um, rather than start with an objective definition, point out that subjectivity, and this is page 13, must be the starting point. Right? First we exist and then we define ourselves. If that is our move, move, I mean, effectively, we are a manifestation of nothing but our freedom. But the corollary to that is that if we are free in this sense and make ourselves as an expression of our freedom, whatever we will become, whatever we do, whatever actions we take, whatever choices we make, fall back on us as our total responsibility. Now, I, I've chosen this book, right, because it's, I, I think, the, 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 the all-around best introduction to Sartre's existentialism. Unfortunately, it's out of print, so you are going to have some difficulties. Um, I've managed this somewhat uh, by posting to Moodle. Uh, you're going to have some difficulties getting a print copy of this book. Um, I actually have two. Um, it, this one I ordered from Aid Books because it is a little cleaner um, a copy than mine, which has my notes in it. But um, nonetheless, right, um, it, this this book is going to be as conversational and as direct an introduction to existential philosophy and existential ethics specifically as you will come across. Um, I, what I'm doing is not, I'm not trying to provide you with an exhaustive treatment of the argument here, but only touch on some of the major themes and major movements uh, that Jean-Paul Sartre um, establishes with regard uh, to, to basically our situation, our condition in the world, uh, the condition in which we find ourselves. Remember, if there is no essence that we fall back upon, where we only define ourselves through our choices and through our freedoms, right? We then have a condition, not a nature. 
right? and this is going to be later on an important argument that he makes. Now, um, that I've treated, it's, it's really sort of quick to treat existentialism because to a certain extent Sartre did such a good job of popularizing existentialism that this is almost intuitive. Right? What we are is what we make ourselves, what we will ourselves to be, right, through our choices, which always have a context, right? And it, I mean, effectively, um, we're thrown into the world to, to abuse um, a, a statement of, um, of another philosopher by the name of Martin Heidegger, right? We're thrown into the world effectively with no owner's manual, with no definition, with no reason for being and that sort of thing, and then asked to give meaning to our lives and make our choices actually mean something. This is what we call subjectivism. Right, which is something that was, um, at the time when Sartre was writing, almost a dirty word, right? It's an accusation uh, of existentialist position. Oh, that's just subjectivism. Where's the objective truth in all of this? Well, no, subjectivism, uh, he points out on 16 and over to 17, um, there are essentially two features of subjectivism, right? Uh, he says, bottom of 16, uh, but the word subjectivism has two meanings and our opponents play on the two. Subjectivism means, on the one hand, that an individual chooses and makes himself, and on the other hand, that it's impossible for men to transcend uh, human subjectivity. The second of these is the essential meaning of existentialism. When we say that man chooses himself, we mean that every one of us does likewise, but we also mean that in making this choice, he also chooses all men, all of mankind, depending on your translation. Um, in fact, in creating the, the, the person that we want to be, there's not a single one of our acts uh, which does not at the same time create an image of humankind as we think he ought to be. To choose to be this or that is to affirm at the same time the value of what we choose because we can never choose evil. We always choose the good and nothing can be good for us without being good for all. You see, essentially what Sartre is claiming with regard to the second mean meaning of, of subjectivism, both really apply, right? The individual makes and chooses himself, right? This is fine, we're all unique and beautiful flowers and that sort of thing. But nonetheless, more prevalently, right, what, what Sartre wants to assert that it's, 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 it's impossible for human beings to transcend human subjectivity. That is, right, whatever we choose to be is, it's not just some flippant choice, but rather it's a normative statement. We are essentially all trying to be the best human beings that we can be. Essentially, what we are doing with each and every one of our choices and our actions, if existence precedes essence, is defining all of humankind. Now, in the 80s and 90s, there was this you know, sort of trend in science fiction. Um, uh, there was a series called The Outer Limits, and one of their favorite tropes was having a, an alien intelligence encounter samplings of human beings that would be in captivity or um, just observed by these alien creatures. And on the basis of the, the one or two or maybe five human beings, right, effectively what these alien intelligences would do is evaluate what sort of creature human beings are, right? In a way that's going to go govern all sort, sorts of interactions in the future with these technologically advanced aliens, right? Now, this is interesting insofar as it, it illustrates what Sartre is saying about existentialism. These few individuals wound up through their choices and actions step, stepping in as a definition for the whole of humankind. Now, effectively, what we are doing, according to Sartre, every time we choose and every time we act is essentially the same thing. 
if existence precedes essence, if we don't have an essence and only manufacture what human beings mean and stand for through our actions, effectively through each and every one of our individual choices and actions, we are defining the whole of humanity. We are, right? On our own, individually, right? So if you choose to um, kill a person, if you choose to cheat on an exam, if you choose to cheat on your spouse, if you choose to stand by your principles, if you choose to steal a lot of money from a multinational corporation, if you choose to mug an old lady walking home from the grocery store, if you choose to help those less fortunate than you, this becomes part of the definition of what it means to be human. We are effectively, with each of our choices and or actions, creating the meaning of human. Now, historically, what has this meant? Right? What sort of major sort of actions? Effectively, and I've already sort of it, it laid this out for you to a certain extent, I mean, Sartre was a resistance fighter in Nazi-occupied France. Right? And what it meant to be human was decisively affected right, by the activities of the Nazi war machine and their eugenic purge of Germany and their conquest of Europe and their sort of megalomania sort of designs on the rest of the world. What it means to be human is implicated by those choices and those actions. Right? Now, in terms of this sort of counter-revolution, what it meant to be human was also created, manufactured, and, and, and epitomized in the choices of those human beings that, resent, uh, that, that resisted this tendency. Right? Everything is at stake. I mean, if there is nothing in heaven nothing in the skies, no definition, no essence, no metaphysical reality that defines human being, right? then effectively the buck stops with us. The buck stops with us. What it means to be human, we're making it, we're building it. Right? So this is what Sartre means um, in terms of, of, of his statement, right, which you find on, um, on page 18, in choosing myself, I choose man or all of mankind, right? Um, but it, boo, boo. Um, it, let's start on 17, to, uh, to make a more individual manner. Um, if I want to marry, to have children, even if this marriage depends solely on my own circumstances or passion or wish, I'm involving you, all of humanity in uh, monogamy, and not merely myself. Therefore, I'm responsible for myself and for everyone else in creating a certain image of human, of my own choosing, and choosing myself, I choose mankind. Right? Now, effectively, this, this, this publication is called Existentialism and Human Emotions because effectively what Sartre wants to do is lay out uh, the sort of emotional sort of disposition to our freedom that we should have if we are being honest with ourselves. Right? Now, most of us tend to run away from this kind of freedom, and Nietzsche, Nietzsche introduced that in his Beyond Good and Evil, where, where he's talking about this tendency to pretend like we're, to, uh, like we're determined, like we have no choice, like it's not up to us, like we're free. Right? Uh, the modern sort of epitome of this might be, I'm sorry, it's company policy or something along those lines, but no, you're choosing to work for a company with that policy. Right? Aren't you embarrassed? I like to to, 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 to turn to these people and I'm sorry, it's company policy. Aren't you embarrassed to work for a company that has that policy? Well, everybody needs a job, sir. Yes, but there are many ways to earn a living, right? By engaging 
in the activities that you're engaging in. Effectively, you are tacitly consenting, and this is where the notion from Socrates comes from, to that policy. Effectively, by enacting that policy, you are validating that policy in choosing yourself, in choosing your actions, in choosing to, to, to instantiate a particular kind of policy you are defining what human being is. There's no, there's no wiggling out of your responsibility. And this is the, the main tension that defines existentialism and existentialist ethics. It's this sort of interrelatedness, the, 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 the inescapable reality that if we are truly free, most people say, hey, yeah, I like to be free. I'm free, it's, look at my freedom. We are absolutely in a deep, profound sense, responsible for absolutely everything that happens to us. You can't have the one without the other, right? If we're not free, then we're not responsible. And if we're not responsible, then guess what? The whole of ethics doesn't mean a lick. It doesn't mean a lick. And what's more, any of your choices, any of your achievements, any of your experiences are meaningless as well if you're not free. So, effectively, what Sartre is doing is laying out the landscape of human meaning, and he's doing something else, too, that I find sort of absent in all of moral philosophy, right up to Nietzsche to a certain extent, but Sartre makes it quite explicit, as does Simone de Beauvoir and a few others. Right? Effectively, I mean, what we saw up to the moderns is this, it's reason that influences our choices and is the father of ethics, right? It's, it's the, the wellspring from which the ethics flows, right? But this does not sort of encapsulate the actual real lived experience of an ethical quandary. Picture yourself having hit somebody with a car, right? Or even hit another vehicle with a car. Right? Your heart is pounding, right? your hands are shaking, you're nervous, you realize you've done something and you're not in everything that you do leading up to that moment and everything in that moment is going to be punctuated by these emotional states. So effectively what Sartre is trying to lay out for you is the three big emotional states, that is, anxiety, forlornness, and despair, that you are going to, of necessity, if you're honest with yourself, experience as uh, the foundation of your ethical life. You should be anxious, you should feel forlorn, and you should experience despair, if you're honest with yourself. So. That is um, what he is going to do, um, and uh, so effectively, this first video is going to take us as far as about page 33, where he um, it goes through each of these emotional states. So this will be the first of um, three videos, right, that, um, that this is the introductory introductory uh, video with regard to existentialism. The next video will concentrate on anxiety, forlornness, and despair. And then um, the fo following video will um, deal with some of the nuances of this theory as well as um, follow tr uh, Sartre's treatment with regard to how on the basis of existentialism we are actually able to make an ethical judgment. Now. The last thing I'll say on this video is uh, Sartian ethics is a, a big bite of the thumb, to use Shakespearean language, um, at the kind of disposition to ethics is sort of instantiated by people like Immanuel Kant and John Stuart Mill, who presented you with systems, systematic, systematic ways of uh, making choices. Right? Effectively, if you apply the formulations of the categorical imperative and will all of your actions to be universal moral law, treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of another, as always as an end and never merely as a means, that sort of thing. If you do these things, 
and things don't go your way or somebody has a problem with you, what do you say? Well, I don't know, I just did what Kant told me to. Right? Or if you uh, calculate the greatest good for the greatest number and it doesn't work out, you wind up upsetting someone. Right? It, effectively, you fall back on, well, it's the utilitarians that, you know, this was an application of this system and the result, maybe you don't like it, but it's not my fault. It's John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham. They're at fault. Right? The utilitarian said, that's essentially what the existentialist would call bad faith. The essence of bad faith is fleeing from your freedom, running away in some sort of mamby-pamby, oh, it's not my fault kind of way. Right? Far too often this happens, and effectively existentialism's move is to call bull on all of that. You are the one who chose that. It's you. It's not anybody else. Right? It's not Sartre. Or it's not Jean Paul Sartre said. It's not Aristotle said. It's not Socrates said. It's not Kant said. It's not Mill said. It's not Mom and Dad told me to do this or my boss told me to do this or anything along those lines. You are absolutely responsible for who you are and what you do. It's you. It's not anybody else. Right. So effectively, existentialism is a, a theory, right? as an ethical theory, presents you with the idea that, yeah, it is. It is you. It is your fault. Right? Deal with it. Right? And the way we should feel about that sort of insight is anxious, man. Forlorn, how do we know what the right thing to do is? How, how do we know? Right? And despair, right? Which is, in very general terms, right? the, the fact that there are no guarantees in life. We just do our best. And if it doesn't work out, it's, yeah, it's still our fault. We should be anxious. And, you know, there's no rule book to tell us what to do. So there's no wiggling out of our responsibility. And there's no complaining that I did everything right. Why didn't this work out? Right? Because there are no guarantees. Right? There are absolutely no guarantees in life. Right? So, existentialism, right? uh, and in its purest form, existentialism is simply confronting you with the reality of your freedom and your responsibility.